I am a Christ follower. I'm here for anger, sexual sin, and gluttony. My name is Digga. Hey, gang. Uh, you never let go. Matt Redman, R-E-D-M-A-N, just in case uh, uh, you're not sure who re- uh, sang that song. I th- heard a lot of people singing, so I, I, I suspect it's a pretty popular song out there with most of the folks. But uh, I picked it for two reasons. I, and again, we're very uh, deliberate on what we try to do up here and say and select and all that. Um, and I selected it for two reasons. Right now, I and many people in this room are going through a step study which is a wonderful experience. It really is overall. Um, And it brings out miracles. I I am a miracle because of Jesus Christ. Um, Anybody that knows my story, and I always pick on Gary, but he knows the story. Um, And I and many other people here are miracles because of Jesus Christ's power. Um, So so, uh, the 12 steps work, but there's a pot in the 12 step, and it's called the fourth step and the fourth principle where we're doing our inventories. And it's hard. When you have to look at your past, it brings up a lot of motions and thoughts, at least in my mind. And I suspect, suspect, again, I'm not the only person that when they're doing their inventory sheets, it's just cringing at some of the things that I have done in my life. Um, So I wanted to remind all those folks out there in a step study right now, and all the folks that are here tonight, that Jesus Christ, God, never lets go. He's there in your highs. He's there in your lows. He's there through the storms. It will end. The pain, the agony, anything that you're going through, through this process and through Jesus' power, you can be changed. It, it happens all the time here. Again, I've been doing this now nine years. My ma- No, 12 years. <laughs> August 2012. Somebody do the math for me. 11 11 years. Thank you. Somebody that's a mathematician, double figures. Remember, I only, four is my number. I get, I get to four and I I struggle. Um, But it, this program works. Now, the other reason I selected it is, look, some of you are not going through a step study right now, or even if you are going through a step study, maybe again, you're experiencing some highs or lows. I like to remind people why we came to celebrate recovery. You came here looking for an answer. I did. I suspect you did too. And the answer is Jesus. And he's there. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. If you can't change yourself, which I couldn't after 50 whatever years it was, but Jesus can and he did. And he's omnipresent. He's always with you. Now, that's hard for us to understand because I am a finite human being. But Jesus, God, is not. He is infinite. He transcends anything that I could possibly understand. So I can assure you he is with us in this room right now, and he's going to be with you when you walk out this door tonight, and he's with you when things are not going well and when they are going well. And here's the trick. And after years and years, again, anybody, because we got a lot of new faces out there, look, nobody up on this stage, especially me, is perfect. You're never going to be perfect. Get over it. One perfect person, Jesus Christ. The rest of us are sinners saved by his grace. I'm trying to do better every day, but I ain't going to get there until I meet him in heaven someday when I, when I, when I meet him for the first time in person. So... This program works, and you need to just keep praising him through the good, which we tend to do, but we're in, the, we're in the lows, at least for me, when I'm in the storm, especially when I first started Celebrate Recovery, it was really hard to praise him. I was cussing him. Like I said, I like the number four for a reason. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can drop some, some four-letter words. Again, a lot, lot has changed since Celebrate Recovery. But I would cuss him out. Probably not a good idea, by the way. But it's the truth. I don't do that anymore. God bless you. God bless you, Risa. He can save us. He can change us. So he's always with us. So when you walk out the door tonight, continue to praise him. This is a praise room. It's not hard to praise Jesus or God when we're in here. It's a lot harder, at least if you're anything like me, But I assure you that praise will pay off in the long run. He loves you, he knows you, and he wants to change you. He loves you too much to keep you where you're at.
at least he did with me, I suspect. Roger's shaking his head. Thank you, Roger. I'm not the only one up here that's, that's a little screwed up. Good, good. Amen. All right. Um, so principle four, step four. <clears throat> Openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. That is principle four. Happy of the pure at heart, Matthew 5, 8. All of our principles are tied to the Beatitudes, chapter 5 in uh, Matthew. So that's the beatitude that's associated with the step. We conducted a fearless and searching moral inventory of ourselves. And then the scripture that's associated, because we always want to go back to scripture, because that's the truth. This is the truth. We, let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord, Lamentations 340. And if you think about that, that's exactly what a moral inventory is. By the way, moral just means honest, right? We're going to do an honest inventory. We're going to look at all the bad that's happened in our life. We're going to look at the good, too. A balanced inventory is really important. All right. Before you start doing an inventory, um, let, me, let me go back one second. Because, again, we've got a lot of new folks out here. So, principle four, step four, five lessons. The next closest is principle seven with three. So principle four, step four, five lessons, pretty important. You have to look at your past. We are all probably taught, at least I was, don't worry about the past. Worry about today, you know, God's got your future, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't really believe that at the time, but that's what I was told. But I always worried about my past. You got to look at it. You got to work through it. You got to work through, especially for the guys out there, you got to work through those emotions. I know that's a tough word for some of the guys out there, but you got to feel those things, the hurt, the resentment, the anger, all of it. You got to experience it so you can work through it. You cannot hide it. You can't lie about it. You got to deal with it. So that's what principle four and step four are so important. And that's why we've spent, or we're going to spend five lessons on it. Now, We've spent three lessons so far. If we remember, sponsor. Really important to have a sponsor during step four, principle four. Then we talked about moral, which is basically what an inventory is. Again, I've just said it. It's an honest look at our past, both the good and the bad. Then we had an inventory class last week by Tanya, and she worked you through the inventory sheet. In other words, how to fill out the inventory sheet. Tonight and next week, I'm going to talk about spiritual inventory one and two. Um, and that's simply, if you will, what are some of the questions you can ask yourself to help you get started on that inventory? And tonight we're going to talk about, there's eight of them, by the way. And we're going to talk about four of them tonight. And we're going to talk about four of them next week. Four tonight, we're going to talk about relationship with others. We're going to talk about our attitude, attitude, we're going to talk about our priorities, and we're going to talk about integrity and how those character or those possible sins are impacting our joy, peace, etc., if you will, the fruit of the Spirit. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So we've got tonight and next week, and then we still have two more lessons in principle four, but we get to step five when we get to confess and admit. So we still got about another month, month and a half of principle four, step four and five. It's that important that we do this. And when we get to step five, I can assure you, when you sit down with that sponsor and you read those inventory sheets, that is extremely healing. It is extremely, it is just a cathodic experience. It really is. All right. Next slide, please. I had to throw one slide up there. Again, Tanya is not here. So Dave, I would appreciate if you'd take a picture of that and said that was for her. So, any, so anybody that knows, Tanya is the cat person. I'm more of a dog person. And I thought this was a little appropriate since I'm so fond of cats. Actually, we have two, by the way. We have two. Yeah, they're like dogs, though. Thank God. Thank God they're like dogs. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So before we get into the four things tonight, and I'll go really quickly and stuff. And again, thank you for four, four uh, letter. It's not an acrostic, but it's only four items I need to discuss tonight. So one of the things you should always do before you do an inventory sheet, when you're starting to sit down, obviously you should be probably calling your sponsor or meeting with your sponsor. It depends on where you're at in the walk. 
but you definitely need to talk to your sponsor. The other thing I would recommend you strong, strongly recommend you uh, memorize this prayer. And I used this tonight in our step study. It is extremely powerful scripture because when you're doing your inventory sheets, a lot of bad things come up. Again, I did a lot of bad things. I physically, mentally, verbally abused many people in my family over the years. So again, when I'm going through my inventory sheets, that is hard. I feel guilty. I don't feel shame as much anymore because shame is of the world. I've told you that before and guilt is of God. So I feel guilty. So I don't feel real good at the time. So I always go back to this scripture. It's Isaiah. Excuse me. Oh, I got the wrong one. Isaiah 118. Yeah. Dave? No, yeah, please. I, I pulled up the wrong scripture. I read the wrong scripture. Oh, I got it. I'm sorry. It, it was right above it, Dave. Don't mind me. It's tough when you're in your 60s, by the way. So you, 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 when you get there, you'll understand. All right, Isaiah 118, good scripture to memorize. Come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. Again, really powerful scripture to remind yourself, look, he's got you. There's nothing that you or I have done that he cannot forgive and that you can't be changed and move on. All right, so let's talk about these tonight. First one, relationship with others. Now, so we're going to be looking at, I'm going to call them character defects, character shortcomings, if you prefer sins, that are impacting our lives. So I suspect relationships with others in your life have impacted your walk with Christ or your walk in life. Probably stolen joy at times, stolen peace. Whether you were the person that was hurting somebody or you were being the person that was being hurt, that was probably not a wonderful experience at the time, right? So relationship with others has impacted your life. It's the best first question you can ask yourself when you're doing the inventory sheets. Remember, columns one through five. So these are some of the questions that you might want to ask yourself. And by the way, so if you're in Celebrate Recovery step study right now, all of these come right out of this pamphlet. Spiritual inventory lesson one and next week spiritual inventory two. So if you're wondering what questions to ask, you've already done it. You've probably already done spiritual inventory one and two. We did two tonight, Mike, right? We did two tonight. So again, but these are some of the questions that you can ask yourself to help you get started with your inventory, specifically relationship with others. First, let me just give you some scripture because we always go to the truth. Forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Don't bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's Matthew 6, 12, 13. The Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, right? All right, good, good first question. Who has hurt you? Put that person in column one, right? Who has hurt you? Against him, whom have you been holding a grudge? Grudges don't do well for you folks. Resentment don't do well. You've heard me say this. This is actually Tanya's, so it's not my creation. But when you are resentful or holding a grudge, it's like drinking poison, hoping the other person's gonna die. Doesn't work that way. Who's drinking the poison? Me. So I'm the one that's going to get poisoned, if you will, literally from the inside out. That's how resentment and, and grudges work. So there's no room for grudges and resentment. So we want to deal with that. If you've got anybody in your life, you've got any grudges or resentments, again, we want to deal with it. Against whom are you seeking revenge? Again, that's a, that's a pretty harsh one, but... When I start, started Celebrate Recovery, I was all about revenge. And I can't be the only one. I wanted to kill the person in my life that I was thinking that was the problem. I was the problem, by the way. But, but again, back in 2012, I didn't think I was the problem. I thought somebody in my family, if you will, extended family, ex-spouse from my wife, was the problem. And I wanted revenge. And it destroyed my marriage. Literally destroyed my marriage. I allowed it to. But it's, you, you can't, revenge is God's. That's not our plan. The craziness that's going on in the world, whether you agree or disagree, 
That's out there. That's the world. God's got this. He is in control. I don't need to worry about out there. He's got it. He's in the boat with us. The winds, the storms all around us, and he's sitting there sleeping. We're frantic, and he goes, we wake him up, because we don't trust God all the time, and he goes, quiet, and everything goes still. He's got it. He had it when he was sleeping, by the way. He's God. All right. Yeah. Are you jealous of someone else? Good question to ask. Are you jealous of someone else? All right, this is always a tough one. Who have you hurt? Who have you hurt? Who have I hurt? My inventory sheets were all about who I hurt. I've done seven step studies now over the years, so I've gotten to the column where I, I, people have hurt me, but I thought I, it was all about who I hurt. I suspect the person in column one that's hurt you, it was probably, again, if you're anything like me, in column five, I've hurt that person back because, again, I didn't take that hurt well. Usually I responded inappropriately, angrily, yelling, screaming, hitting, whatever. You get the idea. So the person in column one may have done something, but again, I own my responsibility, my part. I'm the one that reacted inappropriately. It wasn't my wife's ex-husband's fault because he was a, you know what. That was my problem. I responded inappropriately and I was impacted. I don't think he even cared. Who have you criticized or gossiped about? That's a good one, boy. I'm a little critical of the world right now. Again, I'm on the left and right of the podium for a reason. I don't want anybody to think I'm, I hang on one side of the political aisle here. Left, right, right, left. But my point is, there's a lot out there and stuff. Again, he's got it. I don't need to be concerned about it. I need to do my part. I have control over my behavior. That's it. I don't have any control of anything going on in Tallahassee or Washington, D.C. or in the Pentagon or wherever it is. I got no control over that. I do what I'm supposed to do. Lastly, have you justified your bad attitude by saying it is their fault? I sure did. I blamed everybody. I didn't even think I had a problem when I walked in the door. I was just coming through the door because it was a last ditch effort to save my marriage. My wife was leaving me. It was like, okay, well, maybe I'll do this, celebrate recovery and see what happens. So I had a pretty bad attitude. Good question to ask yourself. Why did you walk through the door? I've heard a lot of people say, I work, walked through the door because my spouse is here. I probably wanted to support them, but this is really not for me. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. If you say so. All right. Next one, priorities in life, really important one. Now, I would like you to turn your sheet over, um, and I put up priorities there. Career, again, this is all out of, by the way, the, the, the Celebrate Recovery uh, student pamphlet too. Career, family, church, Christ, friendships, money, ministry. Just on the back for a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you two minutes of work to do. Put those in the order that in your life what the priority was. So here, just let me give you a hint. Christ was about seven on my list when I walked through Celebrate Recovery in August of 2012. He's number one right now. Despite, again, I fail. But he wasn't the center of my life. When I truly looked at what my priorities were back in August 2012 during my first step study, I couldn't put Christ at the top. I realistically thought, he's at the bottom. All those are important to me. My family, I'm, I'm the, you know, the, I'm the, was the, the breadwinner. I was the one that was working. I needed to bring fun, mo, money home, blah, blah, blah. Church, I really liked the church. Dave, it was a six or seven, by the way, at that time. <laughs> six or seven. Dave knows, Dave knows the story when I walked through this church in 06. That's a whole other thing. That's my testimony. But church and Christ were six, seven. Friendships were really important to me. Money, yeah, one on the list. August of 2012, that was one on the list. Ministry, I didn't have a ministry at the time. So I was like, okay, I'll put that five or six, seven, whatever it was. 
So what are your priorities? Don't, don't, this is rhetorical. You turned it over. I just want you to think about it. Because here's the thing. Our priorities in life is what's important to us, right? We do what's important to us. I love golf. I like to spend a lot of time at the golf course. I love cigars. I spend a lot of time smoking cigars. Not good for me, I get that. But you understand my, my thing here. I like some TV, comedies especially. I spend a lot of time at TV, in front of the TV. I haven't mentioned Christ in there yet, have I, Roger? No. You get the idea. A lot, lot better than I was in 2012. And I say he's number one. I'm probably not realistically on a daily basis putting him first still. There's probably some other things in my life that I'm putting a little bit more time and effort into. If I wanted to be truthful with myself, and I do. All right, some questions. After accepting Jesus Christ, in what areas of your life are you still not putting God first? I hold on to some of my sins. I really like food, especially ice cream. So I can get a little gluttonous with ice cream. I don't want to give that up. That's a pleasure. I, 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 I like that pleasure. I like eating ice cream. Sometimes I overdo it. You get the idea. So I haven't given everything up yet. I need to surrender it all. We need to surrender it all. All the big and all the small. What in your past is interfering with you doing God's will? Your ambition, pleasures, yes. Job, hobbies, money, friendships, personal goals. What is preventing you and me from totally surrendering our life to Jesus Christ? We've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, but have we totally turned our lives over to him? I haven't. In the 11 years, I think that's the right number, 11 years I've been at Celebrate Recovery, I still have not surrendered all of my hurts, habits, and hangups to him for these reasons. Pleasure's a big one. Pride's another one. I'd actually call it arrogance. I can be arrogant. Sometimes I think I'm right and others not. I, I like to think I'm right sometimes. A little bit arrogant of me. You get the idea. There's things that are impeding my progress in this journey. I'm asking you rhetorically if you have anything like that in your life. He will give priorities. He will give them to you if you give him first place in your life. That's blessings. And live as he wants you to. That's Matthew 6, 33. We always want to go back to scripture because God's word is the truth. When he promises, he keeps his promise, period. Next, attitude. Yeah. Yeah. I was all set up for Tanya tonight. <laughs> Get rid of all bitterness, passion, and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. That's Ephesians 4.31. That's the Apostle Paul. Attitude's a big one. So I'm a believer. What I think up here leads to how I feel, leads to my behavior. You may be of somebody that thinks how I feel leads to how I think, leads to my behavior. You might even be able to, a behavioralist that thinks the way I behave is teaches, helps me, uh, my impact on my feelings and my thoughts. Whatever you want to think, it's up to you. I believe it all starts up here. What I tell myself in my mind affects my emotions and affects my behavior. So it's really important that the real that's going off in my head is the truth. Because Satan is a son of a you-know-what. Especially when we're working on principle four, step four. He does not want you to get well. And he is going to mess with you royally. And he is going to put thoughts in your head like, you're not worthy. Look at what you did. You abused your wife. What is wrong with you? You get the idea, the real that can go off in your head. Then you get into that emotional state. And then what do I do? I start sinning more. One after another after another. Again, I am an addictive personality. So I'm just going to keep more and more. You got to replace it with truth. Tanya told you that last week. When those thoughts of inadequacy, of you're not worth it, you're bad, Whatever it is, you're fat, you're skinny, you're smart, you're not smart, whatever it is, that's the world. 
Jesus Christ loves you the way you are, period. Again, he wants you to be even better, so he's willing to help you change. But he loves you the way you are. He made you. He knew you before you knew anything, right? When you were in the womb. He's got a plan. He knows what's going to happen to the world. He knows what's going to happen with you. He's got you tomorrow. He's got my tomorrow. All right. So it's important what we say to ourselves. Have you always complained about your circumstances? Do everything without complaining or arguing. Philippians 2.14. I have on my mirror a whole bunch of scripture. That's one of them. I love to complain and I love to argue. Again, a lot better. Again, I I don't mean to be too self-effacing up here. I've made a lot of progress because Jesus has, if you will, helped the sinner. But at the end of the day, we love to complain and we love to argue. That's just a lack of trust. Again, he's got it. Whatever the circumstances is, is the circumstance you can't control, unless you created it. You can't control it. He's got it. You got to trust that he's got it. It may not be something that you're enjoying at the moment. Remember the lows, the storms that we talked about in that song from Matt Redman? But Jesus has got it. So you got to trust him. In what areas, of li- what areas of your life are you ungrateful? There's nothing more important than being grateful. You want to praise him and you want to thank him. Every morning when I wake up, the first words out of my mouth is, thank you for letting me up this morning. I figure one of these days he's going to take me, Dave. Right, right in my sleep, I hope. I, ho- I hope. And then right before bed, I get down on my knees again, and I thank him for the day. Despite some of the bad that may have occurred, sometimes again, a result of my poor decisions. But whatever happened that day, I thank him for it. If we're thankful, if we're focused on him, we can't focus on the craziness around us. Gaze at him, as Dave always says, glance at the problems. Have you gotten angry and easily blown up at people? I'm going to bypass that one, Dave. (laughs) (laughs) Intimately familiar with that one. Angry doesn't do, do, do any of us any good, folks. And blowing up at people, I was just advising somebody this the other day. He did not heed my words. Um, and he blew up at somebody, and I think it's irreparable. I, I really do. I think the relationship is going to break up. Words have meaning, and words hurt, and people don't forget words. So be careful what you're saying to people. Have you been sarcastic? <laughs> you, by the way, the timing was impeccable. You just walked in the door. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, you can turn around if you want. <laughs> Just walked in. What in your past is causing you fear or anxiety? Somebody got up here early and talked about fear. Fear is a big one. Fear is a big one. It's a lack of trust. God's got it. But most of us through our lives, people have let us down. Or we've let people down. So we're fearful of all kinds of different things. God's got it. Again, but you've got to explore that. You've got to explore the fear. You've got to explore the, angry, uh, the anger. Remember, these are things that you're wanting to go back and work through so you can grow. Because that's what Celebrate Recovery is all about, right? Spiritual growth. All right, last one, integrity. Do not lie to each other. You have left your old sinful life and the things you did before. That's Colossians 3.9. Again, that's the Apostle Paul. In what past dealings were you dishonest? Now, again, I've got some addictive behaviors over the years that I've hidden from my wife. I became really pretty good at it. It was a lot of work, though. You know, mouthwash, toothpaste, you get the idea. All these different things that I had with me to make sure that she didn't know I was doing things that she didn't want me to be doing. It's a lot of work. And sooner or later, you're going to get caught. I get caught. It's just not a good thing. And you feel bad about it. Look, if you're lying to someone else, like I was lying to my spouse for many years, you're lying to yourself. And that's the worst person you can lie to. You have got to get straight with the truth. And the truth can be found in the Bible. 
if you get straight with the truth, you'll understand that you are worthy because he says you're worthy and you can continue to grow. Because the biggest problem that happens when people walk through that door and leave is because they just don't think they can be changed. I've done too much. I've, I've masturbated. I've, uh, I've committed pornography. I watched pornography. I've, uh, I've got a venereal disease. You go down the list. By the way, done all of those. You get the idea. There's nothing that you've done that Jesus Christ cannot forgive you of if you ask him. I've had to ask a lot of forgiving over the years. Three venereal diseases. One I gave to my wife. That was a really popular day in my, my household. You get the idea. I was an absolute mess. I'm not anymore. And you and many people out there, and I'm looking at many of them, I've watched God work miracles in your life. So the inventory, even though it's really painful at times, is really important. You've got to do it. You've got to explore these things and you've got to tell the truth. I have no issue sharing with you anything that I've done in my life that's wrong. I know I am a sinner. And I know, again, I'm saved by the grace of God. And I've asked him for my, his forgiveness. He's forgiven me. Now, again, not perfect. I continue to mess up. But he's forgiven me for those sins. And my wife and I, actually, Pastor Dave, renewed our wedding vows. We're still married. For those people that don't know, we're still married after 32 years. And, and how, I'm going to say how, I really have no idea, but I do know. It's God. It's Jesus Christ. He healed my wife's heart after all the hurt that I gave her. Some more questions under integrity. Have you stolen things? Have you exaggerated to make yourself look better? Resumes are, those are tough sometimes. <laughs> Border, borderline resumes, right? Just don't lie. You, you, you know, if you are the best manager ever, I don't, you know, I mean, that's, that's subjective. Yeah. Stretch. <laughs> In what areas of your past have you used false humility? That's a good one. A lot, a lot of people use false humility. Have you lived one way in front of your Christian friends and another way at home or at work? I did that for an awfully long time. I had a boss of mine think I had the perfect family. He had no idea what was going on behind closed doors. Zero idea. Thought we were perfect. Nobody's perfect. So, again, are you going to be honest with yourself? Or are you going to be honest with others? And in Celebrate Recovery, we are. We sit through a 12-step and men with men and women with women and share groups here right after this. And we tell each other the most intimate details of our lives. Knowing that that's going to stay in that group and it'll never be discussed outside the group. But it is important and it is cathartic to get that out. To be able to tell somebody the things that I've done in my life and to hear the other things people have done in their lives, it's healing. And that's what this is all about. That's what principle four, step five, and two more weeks are going to be about. We want to be healed. And that's how we work this through. We've got to do the inventory. So next week, we're going to do four more of these. Um, and we'll see how that goes. All right? So uh, let's go ahead and do the uh, serenity prayer. Thank you so much.